Okay. This is conservation biology take four. This time my mic is plugged in. I'm not taking any calls from UPS. I remember the word lamprey and a thousand times a thousand is a million. So you'll see where all these things uh, are important pop up later. This lecture is uh, the second part of the diversity lectures uh, related to biodiversity. This one is about um, diversity in deep time. So going back to the beginning of life as we know it, uh, big space would be how diversity, um, how it's arranged and patterns across the entire planet. And deep taxonomy is talking about the taxonomy uh, among the largest groupings. So uh, the diversity of plants versus diversity of animals and bacteria so getting back into time, um, if you, so here's a graph where uh, the Cambrian is the earliest that there's a pre-Cambrian, um, but really life exploded during the Cambrian, so it really took off. Um, and then this is now. Okay. And what you'll find is that species richness goes um, up and down. So it increases and decreases, increases and decreases. And at any point, uh, you pick a random point, that point has been a balance of the rate at which species are appearing and the rate at which species are disappearing. So when you have that happen over long terms, you get increasing trends and, and decreasing trends. So when speciation exceeds extinction, you have increasing number of species. And when extinction exceeds uh, speciation, you get declines. And these speciation extinction events are completely natural, right? Um, do note that if we go back to the Cambrian, look at now, there, has, there is an increase in the number of genera, okay, which is supposed to be representative of the number of species. So that has increased over time, okay. Uh, and do note that it's not smooth at all. So what you get is uh, periods where there's um, Speciation with smaller extinctions, okay? And these extinction events really mark for geologists uh, these differences. So we have um, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. And the, what separates the Ordovician from the Silurian is we have an extinction event, an extinction event, uh, an extinction event. So it's the difference in the animals and plants that make up um, the composition of these time periods that delineate uh, the, the line between them. So it would be extinction events really kick off uh, one time period to the next, okay? Some of these extinction events are relatively minor. So we have small dips in here and some of them are large. So the end of the Ordovician, um, end of the Devonian, and, and the Permian, end of the Cretaceous. So these are mass extinction events. The um, one with, that was the most dramatic was the end of the Permian. And what happened here is the earth really cooled down very quickly and was, uh, was covered in lots of ice and lots of snow. And uh, probably a few degrees from completely losing all of life on this planet above bacteria and viruses. Uh, but that didn't happen and the diversity has recovered relatively quickly. So this large dip at the end of the Permian this marks the end of the, the Paleozoic, 
in the beginning of the, um, the Mesozoic. Okay. The other mass extinction you should know is the end of the Cretaceous. So this is called the KT boundary. Okay. And what happened was, if you've ever watched um, like a dinosaur movie, uh, a large asteroid hits the planet. And that event uh, instantaneously um, bumps off a number of species, but really the, it, it cools off the climate and you get a number of, of extinctions that way. And uh, we've been uh, increasing the number of species ever since. Okay. So a few mass extinctions, and I'll just end by saying that this is compressed so we don't see what's happening now. If we look at what's happening now, we're actually in an age of steep decline. And some people are suggesting this is the sixth math extinction that we're experiencing. We are in it right now. That is due to humans. All right, so looking down through time, so now we're gonna look at some taxonomy and some time together. So um, some groups just have extinctions and are gone completely. Uh, some groups have extinctions and they never recover. So a good example would be the jawless fishes, and this includes the lampreys. There's um, at least two species in Pennsylvania. Okay. There's a small brook lamprey, which is an endangered species. And then there's a lamprey in the Great Lake, which is actually an invasive species that has harmed the Great Lakes fisheries because they're parasitic on things like trout and salmon. So once numerous in the Devonian, they're left with very few species. The placoderms, these are fish with um, very thick outer skin. These just went extinct. Uh, some of the winners would be the ray fin fishes and the tetrapods. Okay, so ray fin fishes are things that uh, you would catch, trout, uh, bass, swordfish, groupers, sunfish, pickerel, uh, these are all doing uh, well, okay? When I say doing well, I mean the number of species has been increasing lately. There are particular species that are not doing well at all. Uh, and then tetrapods are things like mammals, birds, uh, turtles, and snakes and lizards have been increasing over time as well. The lobefin fishes, these are the ancestors of the tetrapods, and um, they had their heyday in the Devonian, and they largely went extinct um, with a, a few exceptions. Uh, most notably would be like the coelacanth, okay? the coelacanth and the lungfish, both lobefin fishes. Some uh, other groups not pictured here would be like the, the uh, flowering plants have really done well. The gymnosperms are in decline. So even within plants, you have winners and losers. And then some groups like viruses and bacteria, we know nothing about. So uh, since they don't leave fossils, it's hard to look at what's uh, happened in the past. And we know about these things through fossils and viruses and bacteria just don't leave fossils. And I don't think there are molecular signatures that we can detect about uh, past patterns and speciation. Okay. So as I pointed out, some of the mass extinctions in the past were about rapid climate change, including the most recent one due to rapid warming. Uh, on the flip side to extinction is speciation, and we can look at things that promote uh, speciation. So things like time and isolation. Um, so it takes time for most species to become new species. The exception is uh, species that arise out of polyploids. We call those instantaneous species and those occur in a single step. Uh, but that's not consistent across all uh, taxa. 
So most taxa um, requires lots of time. So plants is something where you see lots of uh, polyploid species, but you don't see it very often in, in animals. Uh, speciation takes isolation. That helps the speciation process. So this is Costa Rica, and this is uh, a mountain range occurring right through the center. And if you could imagine uh, before this mountain range was there that these valleys were connected. And if you had a species that uh, required whatever habitat this is in the valley, liked it, and then this mountain range uh, formed because this plate is colliding with this plate and pushing up these mountains. Uh, this is happening now. So these mount, this mountain range is actually growing and it's gonna further separate these species. And if you imagine this was a single population, if you divide that up, now you have a population here which is no longer breeds with this population. And that's how you get new species, right? And go back to our species concepts, you can see that um, as soon as you separate them, if you were dealing with evolutionary species concept, you would say this, this population over here and this population were um, no longer breeding, so they would be new species. So mountain ranges um, will create speciation in the valleys, and the valleys uh, will create speciation for things that live in mountaintops. So when this area was warmer, uh, the habitat was the same between these mountaintops, and now that it's uh, relatively cooled off, um, these mountaintops are now separate. So you can get species that occur on these mountaintops that occur nowhere else. Uh, rivers are another one. So when rivers form because of geology, the geology changes. Um, if you have animals that can't cross rivers, then um, you'll get speciation occurring on either side of the river. Those, those organisms that occur on both sides will become different species. If we look at how diversity is ranged in space, uh, what you find is that um, if you look at all groups, sort of all organisms combined, it's highest near the equator and decreases with increasing latitude. So it doesn't matter if you go north or south, that as you move away from the equator, species richness goes down, right? So you get to the poles where it's minimal. Uh, so that's one pattern. The other pattern is, is where net primary productivity is high, you have lots of species. And net primary productivity is when you take atmospheric gaseous uh, carbon dioxide and you fix it, which means you attach this gas um, to a molecule and it becomes, from CO2, it turns into sugars and sugars turn into cellulose and, and other byproducts. But it's basically at the rate at which uh, plants grow. And, and so the material that makes up a plant, most of it was carbon dioxide, right? It's very little protein. Uh, unlike animals, we are mostly proteins. If you look at plants, uh, they're mostly sugars and cellulose and CO2. Okay, that's been, that's been fixed. Where that occurs the fastest, you have lots of species, and that occurs highest at the equator on land. And uh, what you need for primary productivity are two things, is where it's warm and uh, where you have water. Okay. So photosynthesis requires water, right? Why is that? Something to think about. And in marine systems, um, you have lots of species where um, the nutrients are higher. And I'll have a whole lecture on 
uh, marine conservation and marine diversity. But let's just say where the nutrients are higher, you have more species. So moving from the equator to the poles um, means you get fewer species. And what's happening is it's getting cooler. And that same thing happens as you move up in elevation. So species richness gets lower as you move to mountaintops um, because it also gets cooler. That's one, one of the explanations. So as you go up um, an elevation gets colder and colder and colder, you're gonna have fewer and fewer species, okay? And uh, likewise, as you go deeper in the ocean, you get fewer and fewer species. So uh, when you are at the uh, surface of the, of the water, you get lots of different species. And as you uh, move to um, deep water, you get uh, fewer species. So this is the bottom of the ocean. And uh, in many areas, uh, species richness is, is relatively low. Uh, so here we are. This is Cotopaxi, which is near the equator in Denali. I was just, when I took this photo, I compared it to uh, an existing picture in Denali, which I borrowed. And these are similar despite being separated by thousands of miles. Uh, here's on the equator. This is up uh, towards the Arctic. And what you'll see is when you're at lower elevation, you get lots of vegetation. You can imagine this thins out and thins out to get very few species, if any, up in these areas up here. You can find you get some uh, lichens and mosses underneath the ice that can persist, but you're not, you're not getting all the shrubs and all the herbaceous plants that you do down in the valleys. All right, so big taxonomy, so breaking up all life into its biggest groups. And what you'll find is what, how we thought about this has really changed in the last couple of years. When I say the last couple of years, I mean the last three or four years has uh, completely turned upside down what we thought about the world. So in 1992, E.O. Wilson wrote a book um, called Biodiversity. And in that book, he, he outlines the estimates of different animals and plants. And uh, what we thought at the time, and even up until 2011, is that most things were animals. And think about this as a sampling issue because most things we can find and look at and classify would be animals, right? You see an elephant, you, if you saw something like an elephant that wasn't exactly an elephant, you say, well, that might be a different species. If you think about bacteria, you may see two bacteria under um, a very strong microscope and you may not recognize them as being different species, yet uh, their genomes might be completely different. So what's happening is with the rise of bioinformatics and the availability of sequences, once we started sequencing bacteria, uh, we found many, many more bacteria than we thought were out there. And um, this has completely changed the way we uh, slice up life. So we used to think that most of the things on the planet were animals, now we think they're bacteria with a large number of protists and the rest of the things making up uh, about 7%. In the past, we thought most things were animals and then plants and then fungi were also important with a small slice to protists and, and bacteria. And we know that that is completely wrong. So uh, I have here, there's still much to learn uh, with protists. We still don't know much. With bacteria, we're learning lots because there are, there are many initiatives to look at bacteria and soil bacteria. 
there's large um, data banks you can plug your data into, but for things like Protus, they're just, there's not much out there. There's not a large consortium of uh, people working with Protus, um, unfortunately, but I suspect there are many more Protus out there than what we think of. So, um, if we ignore bacteria and just now look at uh, the eukaryotes, we'll say. Um, so this chart has the high estimate, the low estimate, where we think that is. Right? So these would be the highs and lows and where we think somewhere, uh, not necessarily in, in the middle, but between these numbers. And then whether we think that's actually like a good number or a bad number, okay? What should floor you is if you just ignore what group you belong to and just look at uh, our estimates of how many species are out there, how many are moderate to very poor? So uh, most things we only know, we only have moderate to very poor estimates of their diversity. If you look, who's this good, right? We have two goods, plants and chordates. So chordates are animals with backbones. So those would be your fish, birds, amphibians, et cetera, and uh, plants as well. Uh, we have good estimates because they're big. And again, this is all about uh, sampling and uh, plants are relatively easy to recognize when you have new species, same with chordates. So if you see a bird and it's not in any field guide, it's very likely to be a new species. Where things like uh, nematodes, um, if you've ever seen a nematode under a microscope, they all look about the same. And soil nematodes, um, if you scoop a handful of um, soil from a deciduous forest. There are thousands of nematodes. You may have hundreds of species and they all look exactly alike. So there, this is a sampling issue. Okay, so things that look the same, uh, we have very poor estimates of their um, diversity. Okay. So just, we'll go over the working figures uh, pretty quickly, just so you know the, the high points of these things. So this is in estimates in thousands, so 100,000 protozoans. Um, there might be 200,000. I suspect there's actually even more than that. Uh, 300,000 algae, 320,000 plants. Uh, since this is good, there may only be uh, maybe 50% more, so about 500,000 uh, species. Fungi, um, 1.5 million species of fungi. And we should be studying fungi more because not only do they have health implications, these have, have very important ecosystem functions. So we should be investigating fungus much more than what we should. Uh, this says moderate. My guess is once we start looking in the soil and uh, we're going to discover many more species than what we thought. That's just my own personal feelings. Uh, nematodes, again, um, until we start working out the genomes of these things, there could be many more species out there than 500,000. That's still, these numbers are still pretty hard to wrap your, your head around. 1.5 million species of fungi out there. That's, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, for arthropods, uh, the working number is 4.6 million or maybe 100 million species of arthropods out there. Okay. Mollusks, so these are your clams and mussels and whatnot, uh, 120,000. Okay, uh, chordates, which are animals with backbones, 50,000. Not super impressive, right? Our own group is, is not, um, and even if, if you wanna think uh, human-centric, 
our genus has a single species right now, Homo sapiens, and that's it, one species. Uh, the great apes, there's only a handful of great apes, the, the group we belong to with uh, mountain gorillas, lowland gorillas, two species of chimpanzee and orangutan, and then we're done. So uh, chordates are not very species rich. And uh, then there's a number of things that fall between these cracks here. So there are things like tunicates and other kind of rare phyla. Uh, most of them are invertebrates. Um, 800,000, there's probably more, but the working number is 250,000. So if we look at the number of eukaryotic organisms on the planet, we have about 107 million on the high end, a working number of 7.7 7 um, 7 million species uh, to be a working figure. But again, since this is very poor, we don't know if we're on the 3.5 million or we are on the uh, 100 million end. So we're just not sure. It could even exceed this bottom number here on the high end. All right, so the, we looked at all of life, then we excluded bacteria. Now we're just gonna look at animals, so we're not gonna look at plants. Uh, if you just look at animals, most things are inverted. And within invertebrates, most things are insects. And there's some remarkable numbers out there. And if you, I'm looking at this number from the Smithsonian, there's 91,000 species of insects just in the United States with an estimated 73,000 yet to be discovered. Um, many of these being actually little tiny parasitic wasps. And then there's some beetles tend to be very species rich. So of most of the animals, the, the diversity is mostly invertebrates and un, within invertebrates, mostly insects. So most animals, if you just look at what species are, um, the greatest diversity is within insects. And even within insects, it's probably beetles. So, um, Many, many, many beetles on this planet. Um, as I mentioned before, if we just look at what's sampled, that tends to determine our, how good our estimates are. And then the deep sea, there's lots of species yet to be discovered. Okay, we just don't get to the bottom of the oceans and see what's down there. And every expedition always reveals more species. Uh, and then if we looked within the chordates and look at vertebrate diversity, um, most things have been described. So most chordates we know are out there. That's why the diversity measurements are considered good. Uh, teleos, these are bony fish, about 32,000 species and increasing. So we're actually finding more and more. So that's still going up. Birds, again, this is most based mostly on this estimate on the biological species concept, 10,000. I saw an estimate that would put birds at 18,000, 20,000 if we could ex classify most species using the evolutionary phylogenetic species concept. Mammals um, are mostly rodents followed by bats and there's about 8,000 species, right? So most most mammals are mice, mice and squirrels. Lepidosaurs are two ataras, which looks like a lizard, lizards and snakes, and there's about 10,000 species. Okay. Again, we're discovering new species all the time. In amphibians, there's 8,000 species. And again, these numbers are mostly based on the biological species concept, and so, if we were to change our species concept, some of these numbers might double, okay? particularly the amphibians and lepidosaurs. Okay, so let's move from animals to plants. There's about 300,000 species that have been described. 
right? There could be many, many more out there. Uh, most of those species are angiosperms. Um, so these, that's the flowering plants. And within angiosperms, there's about 30,000 species of orchids. So I'm just showing two from uh, the Lancaster um, Botanical Garden in Costa Rica, uh, which is a, a beautiful site you should visit sometime. Uh, but there's many, many orchids out there. So most plants, the diversity are orchids. Although uh, if you were to walk out in a temperate forest, you would see very, very few. Pennsylvania uh, has at least a dozen species of orchids. But if you get down to a place like Costa Rica, you'll find hundreds, if not thousands of species of orchids, many of which are still being discovered. Uh, 15,000 species of mosses. There's 15,000 species of ferns and less than a thousand species of gymnosperms. So these are your uh, pines and spruces and other things like cycads. Um, if you go back to the Cretaceous, much more common, uh, but they're declining in species richness. And there's a number of rare cycads that are disappearing as well, unfortunately. If we look at how diversity is arranged in space, so not looking at the number of species and how they change over space, but if you take all the organisms and look at how they're arranged um, taxonomically, and what you'll find is there are certain patterns we see. Um, we can arrange life by biomes, and a biome is, I would say, the obvious thing you see when you go to a site, you'll know what kind of biome you are. And that's the first place you would describe it. So if you were dropped somewhere on a planet and I said, where are you? And you looked around, you would say it's a desert, it's the tundra, it's the rainforest, it's a deciduous forest, right? And that is based on the plant form, okay? So not taxonomically, but just the form of the plant, like a grass or a succulent. Um, a realm is another way to look at diversity on this planet, and that divides things up based on their shared evolutionary history. So let's pick two. So if you look at the neotropical realm, there's a bunch of organisms that are found here in none, none of the other realms, okay? So like the group uh, I studied in the past the ant birds. Ant birds are only found in the neotropics and nowhere else, right? Uh, the, there's a Nearctic realm, which includes us, and that shares a lot with the Palearctic, okay? So things like maples you'll find in the Palearctic and Nearctic. It's actually difficult to find things that are just Palearctic and things that are Nearctic. Um, and you have Ethiopian, Palearctic, Oriental, and uh, Australasian. And these, if please note that uh, it's largely just based on continent. And we know through plate tectonics that these land masses were isolated. You can go back when they were one unit, right, Pangaea, and then they broke up and some have been um, um, merging again, okay? But when they're isolated, they, they form many of their own life forms and, uh, and and uh, you'll still see those fingerprints today, like Australasian, you'll find a number of uh, organisms there that aren't found anywhere else, right? Cassowary is a good example. So let's go back to biomes. Uh, so that's based on the plant form and the concept of a biome goes back to Alexander von Humboldt who was very important. He predates Darwin. Darwin cites him quite a bit as one of his uh, biology heroes. Uh, he's considered the father of biogeography. So he went around uh, like Darwin, went around um, the 
the world and explored areas. And uh, he's a hero in many parts. There's at least two stamps. I know of many more uh, with uh, Humboldt's uh, face on it. And it's because he really was out there looking for plants that were useful and then sharing them between uh, cultures. And what he noticed is that there are consistent plant forms when you go to different sites, even though they may be separated by long distances. So you can go to the prairie in North America, and it's a grassland. You can go to the pampas in Argentina, it's a grassland. And you can go in, um, in Russia, in Mongolia, you can find grasslands as well. So despite these large separations, there are consistent uh, plant forms in these, in these climates. And biomes are determined by two environmental factors prim primarily. One is annual precipitation, so how much it rains, and then how warm it is. So just to do the corners, so this corner here with tundra would be cold and relatively dry. Uh, this quadrant up in here has no life. So imagine that it's very cold and snows all the time. So this would not be rain. So this is snow covered areas. There's no life. Okay. Down in this bottom quadrant, um, where it's warm but doesn't rain, you have desert. Okay. And then where it's very warm and rains a lot, you have tropical rainforest. And so the the biomes are arranged on this graph. And one of the things I want to point out, we'll go through the different biomes, but I want to point out that not everyone uses the classifications the same. So uh, temperate grassland and desert or something called steppe vegetation, some people recognize that. Tropical seasonal forests, uh, some people don't recognize tropical seasonal. So this is just one classification um, view right now. There's, there's a whole bridge and then there's Whitakers and they're slightly different. So the important thing is to know what drives biomes and then where you find them. So uh, the first caveat I'll throw in is that um, elevation plays an important role. So you'll find a change in biomes. So this is Cotopaxi in Ecuador. So this is down in the valley and you may find, um, this is actually shrub down here and then grassland and then tundra and, and nothing. So nothing lives up here um, except for maybe like this. But for every thousand feet, so Cotopaxi is 13,000 feet. Sorry, I'm using feet because when you deal with mountains, for some reason, you always use feet. Uh, for every, um, I'm sorry, yeah, 13,000 feet. And uh, standing at the base, it's about 9,000. And as you go up, it gets colder and colder. Now I'm going to mix things here, units. So for every thousand meters you go up, okay, it gets colder and colder. For every thousand meters, you decrease by two degrees centigrade. So you're gonna change biomes because you're changing temperatures. Okay? The other thing to be aware of that can change where biomes are found is uh, rain shadows. So, uh the the best case of this is on the uh, that i can think of is the pacific northwest so this would be the cascade range that you might find in oregon and you have these warm moist airs coming off the pacific ocean they hit the mountains and go up and as you go up you cool off and as you cool off you can't hold this much water so it rains these air masses are forced back down the mountain and now you have dry air and it actually will pull moisture out of the ground 
And this is called a rain shadow. So on the other side of a rain shadow, it tends to be very dry and desert-like. Okay, and we'll see some. The other things that can change um, biomes are these ocean currents. So for example, if you look at um, this latitude here, okay, and we just go south of that. So if you just go south, that's Maine. Okay. And we tend to think about Maine as pretty cold. And you can go up to uh, Nova Scotia and uh, Newfoundland, and you can get tundra. Well, if you just go due east, you'll hit England and uh, Ireland. And there you don't find tundra, there you find forest. And England and Ireland, are those climates are very much like what you would find in the Mid-Atlantic area. So how does the Mid-Atlantic area, much farther south, occur in these places like Ireland and, and England? And that's because the circulation here, okay, you have water that's heated up near the equator and it moves so the Gulf Stream moves up along the coast and that warm water heads east and carries it over to England and Ireland. Okay, So you'll see these patterns over and over where warm water that's heated up in the equator will move down and will push the biomes you typically associate with warm places down. So you have the Amazon rainforest right on the equator, but then you find in the, the Atlantic rainforest much further south. And that's because this warm water heats up the air. And so you have a warm air mass that's constantly covering um, coastal South America here, allowing for the Atlantic rainforest here. Uh, likewise, it can cool down places. So here the uh, tropical biome is compressed because cool water is moving up from um, the southern hemisphere, moving north, and that cool air tends to cool uh, these biomes in here. So there's a couple caveats that change where we find biomes. One is uh, mountains, two is ocean circulation. So let's look at the biomes and where we find them uh, over the planet. So I stuck the equator in here. And if you ever wonder where the equator is, I always look at uh, South America and the outermost edge here is about where you find uh, the equator. So straddling the equator on both sides is a uh, tropical rainforest. Okay. So tropical rainforest, you'll only find just north and just south of the equator. And again, it's pushed down where ocean currents from the equator allow warm air masses to push it down. And it's, and it's compressed where uh, the ocean current pushes, uh, cold air is pushed up from the south. And uh, it compresses that biome. So you can look at some of these uh, patterns here, and then you can determine what the ocean patterns are like. So here's rainforest in Madagascar, and you can predict what the weather pattern, what the ocean currents are here and here. Okay. Um, you can also see the effect of mountain ranges. So here's the Rockies. Okay which is cooler and drier. And then you have the Andes down here. So you can see uh, how mountain ranges affect biomes as well. So biomes and ocean currents can sort of move biomes and adjust them. Um, so we have tropical rainforest right on the equator. And then you have um, savanna and tropical grassland on both sides of that. So lots of rain and then grass lines you find where you have less rain and even less than that, you have desert, okay? 
And what's happening is between uh, these edges of the rainforest, the tropics, you have the tropics. And what I mean by that is you have the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Can uh, Capricorn and Cancer. And that's the intertropical convergence zone. And so it doesn't matter if it's winter or summer, uh, this, the sun is, the direct rays are always occurring in that belt. So it's always warm. And grasslands occur where um, it's, it's drier and then deserts where it's driest. And it's driest because you, you have a, a weather pattern where if you look at the equator, the direct rays are, are hitting the planet, it's warm in the air, the air rises, and you have rainfall occurring in the intertropical convergence zone. That air rises and moves away from the equator, okay? And it's meeting another cell, which is relatively dry. So you have two air cells that are dry meeting, and so you don't get a lot of rain. So you tend to find, I'll just go through this, on both sides of the equator, okay, you tend to find uh, tropical rainforests and then grasslands because it's just, the rain is petering out. And then in those convergence zones where dry air is meeting, you tend to have deserts. Okay? So that's moving outward. So you have uh, rainforest, grassland, desert. And from there, uh, you can get all kinds of stuff depending on the rainfall. So uh, you can find uh, there's grasslands. So temperate grasslands make up a huge swath. Okay? And they're found uh, outside that belt. So it would be desert, then, then temperate gra grassland. So temperate compared to tropical. So if you're in the tropics, the uh, temperature changes, but not very much. But in the temperate zone, uh, temperature variation increases. So you get temperate grasslands, and there's also tropical grassland. And the big difference is uh, between those sites, the difference is in uh, how much temperature change there is. So this grassland, uh, a lot of it has to do with this rain shadow here because most of the uh, weather patterns are coming from the west and moving east. So you can get grasslands here. There's a, there's a mountain range here. And so there's the coastal range and then the Rocky Mountains. And both of these create rain shadows. Okay. And there's also a rain shadow formed here. Okay. And then the Andes form a rain shadow here, okay? So it's driven by rainfall and temperature, okay? And then you have uh, large areas of grassland. So this is mostly sheep in Australia, if you were to go and visit. Okay, so mixing in with the temperate zone biomes, you have deciduous forests, okay? which makes up the, what we call the mid latitudes. And when you get to the high latitudes, you really only have two, um, two, two biomes. Uh, this boreal Ortega biome, okay, which covers most of Canada and most of Asia, okay, is just a huge swath of this boreal forest. And uh, we'll get into what that looks like. And above that is tundra. Okay? And because this area of tundra looks huge, but it is not. And it's because it's stretched, right? Because the uh, top of the planet, when you form a straight map, you have to stretch it out. So this area of tundra is much smaller than what it looks. And, and Greenland is not this big. It's because it's stretched out to, to take what's at the top and you're stretching it out, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a bit deceiving. All right. Um, next. 
All right, so let's do a, a quick tour and we'll go from cold, dry to warm, moist. So we're gonna, we're gonna move up the uh, biome. So tundra and paramo. So tundra is what we call that uh, vegetation in the Arctic, which is very low. Um, think of musks and grizzlies and Arctic fox. Paramo has the same form but it's, it's largely tropical. And in fact, um, this vegetation, you can see uh, mosses and some herbaceous cover. And this is close up, some grasses. This is, this is uh, a setback. Um, I took this picture in Ecuador at about 14,000 feet going over the Andes from Quito down to a field station in the Amazon side. Uh, so tundra, know it as very short and short statured um, vegetation. Paramo you find in a, a sliver that rides along the Andes and it's actually endangered habitat in Costa Rica. There's a very thin, very small uh, chunk of paramo in Costa Rica at the highest levels. And in the U.S. around Pennsylvania, you don't find any tundra um, habitat around. The southernmost tundra habitat, I believe, is around Mount Washington in New Hampshire, which has horrible, horrible weather, as you know. So it's like the Arctic up there. There's a small patch of uh, remnant Arctic habitat that's left over from the Pleistocene, which is pretty cool. Okay, then moving south, so uh, if you look down in the, the bottom right hand corner, the, the taiga habitat, uh, this is the largest biome in the world. It's, it's a big chunk of North America and a big chunk of Europe and Asia. Um, so this is uh, temperate, it has very cold winters and mild summers. Um, and most of the plants are conifers, so spruces, pines. Uh, you also find birches and alders. Willows are very common up here. Um, the ericaceae, so that would be the blueberries and cranberries you find up here. Animals, I think of moose and beaver. Okay. Uh, deciduous forest, if you want to see deciduous forest. And you're at Wilkes, just go outside. Uh, temperate, for, temperate deciduous forests. Uh, so temperate refers to the uh, temperature variation. So you get warm to hot summers to cold winters. Um, so this makes up a big chunk, so it's hard to see, of the Eastern North America and uh, Eastern Asia as well, okay? So big chunks of China uh, structurally look just like this. And I know in Japan you have deciduous forests as well. And you have oak maple forests that look amazingly similar to uh, Pennsylvania, except they're just, they're different species but related species. Uh, temperate rainforests, so this does not show up in a, a lot of classifications. Uh, but temperate rainforests occurred where on the, uh, the windward side of a mountain range in the temperate zone. So there's tropical rainforests and temperate rainforests. So this has mild winters and mild summers. And uh, you'll find this in the Pacific Northwest. Really, and it goes up from coastal Alaska down to coastal California. So it's very narrow, but it occurs on a wide range of latitudes. The grassland steep habitat. Uh, so again, this is low lying vegetation, typically no trees, and you'll find grasslands uh, put in the rain show rain shadow of the U.S. and in the large swath of Asia. 
And uh, so grassland, so it's grass. And then animals, you tend to have large herbivorous animals. So there's, there was a European bison. These are American uh, bison. And you have desert habitat. So desert habitat occurs when you have very low rainfall. And it's also temperate. So there are tropical deserts. So realize you have cold deserts, temperate deserts, and, um, and tropical deserts. So this is a temperate desert. So this is the American Southwest. So it can be, as you know, very, very hot, but you also get snow in the desert. It can be very cold in the desert as well. So you get a lot of extremes in the desert. Uh, the major plants of the desert biome, in North America, you'll find cacti. In South American deserts, you'll find cacti as well. Uh, if you go to African deserts, they do not have cacti. Cacti is only found in the Americas. And then you find in African deserts, you find euphorbs. Okay? And euphorbs are um, plants you find here as well. But they become succulents. And, and lots of people, let's see if I have one around. I don't have any around me, but they're common house plants. You know, the, these, uh, they're not cacti, but they have really thick, juicy leaves, and they're easy to take care of because you can forget to water them for weeks. Okay, moving on. Uh, savanna is a transition between forest and desert. And so if you think about it, our grassland, it's where you have grasslands and forests kind of those two biomes merging. So you have grasses in the understory and then you have some canopy of, of trees. Uh, and the trees tend to be shorter in stature. Uh, so we have savanna in, um, in Africa, huge savanna. So if you think about uh, when you watch wildlife shows, that's typically the savanna. And uh, because uh, elephants do maintain the grasses and knock down trees. Uh, you'll see uh, these large areas of grasses, but then you also have some dense thickets, uh, but they tend to be sparse with uh, vegetation growing underneath. Okay. So savanna is where forest and grassland uh, meet and transition. Uh, tropical rainforest, this is where you get steady rainfall throughout the year. There, there does tend to be a wet season and a dry season, but the dry season uh, doesn't occur to the point where uh, most of the plants lose their leaves. I worked in a tropical rainforest and in dry season, uh, plants do shed their leaves like, like they would in Pennsylvania but not all of them do, okay, just some. And so it's consistently warm and consistently wet, and that is where you find tropical rainforests. They tend to be vegetation, very complex. Um, they have high canopies, okay, 40 meters, so 120 feet. You can find these emergence that rise above the canopy. The canopy tends to be uh, 30 to 40 meters, but you can get these single ones pop up that can be much higher. Uh, you often have lots of epiphytes, so plants growing on other plants. So on the very left here, you can see a, a tree that you cannot even see its trunk. It's covered in mosses and bromeliads and orchids. Uh, also what you find in the tropics are lots of lianas. A liana is a woody vine. So we have a few lianas around here. A grape is one, um, poison ivy is another. So woody vine, lots of woody vines in the tropics. And tropical seasonal is where you have very distinct wet and dry seasons. So this is, I tend to see them where you have like a savanna transition to a rainforest. 
and you have um, the west coast of Costa Rica has tropical seasonal habitat. The west, the east coast of Costa Rica tends to be tropical rainforest. So if you go to the Guanacaste region, which is the west coast, and you go during a dry season, it can look like this, where all the grasses are, are dead, or dormant, I should say, and many of the trees have lost their leaves. So this looks like, um, like a sunny late fall winter day in North America, but this is uh, not far from the equator. So this is the Guanacaste region of, uh, of Costa Rica, and you can find this in Panama, up into Mexico, and also in small parts of Africa as well, and Australia, you find tropical seasonal forests. So I'll end this just talking about uh, climate change in biomes. This is conservation biology. And what you'll find is if, if these biomes are determined by temperature and rainfall, and climate change affects both precipitation and temperature, then what's gonna happen to these biomes? Well, what will happen is as these northern areas get warmer, this band that is taiga is going to move north. It's going to shrink the tundra. Deciduous forests will move north and lots of these areas of scrub. Okay, so this is scrub habitat. Savannah you find in southern Texas. I don't know if you've ever been to southern Texas, this cattle country. Okay, uh, this will expand, grasslands will expand. And it'll change what plants grow, including our crops. So if we think about this as the wheat belt, okay, the wheat belt will actually change from being here to moving uh, northwards into Canada. So th that'll affect our economies and uh, as well as not just plants, but animals that are typically found in here will move northwards, okay, including uh, some disease vectors and diseases will move into uh, what was Eastern deciduous forest. So likewise, uh, these habitats that are uh, down here, these, some of these will expand out of the uh, tropics. What's interesting is um, the temperatures will change, but not necessarily the precipitation, because that'll depend on um, where the sun hits um, most of the time and drives the circulation, the vertical circulation of, uh, of air. So you'll see uh, the expansion of uh, the drier biomes, things like grasslands and steppe and, and uh, savanna. You'll see the expansion of those and not necessarily rainforest. So well, it'll never be rainforest here to, regardless of the temperature, because uh, we won't get the rainfall to maintain those types of plants here. So it's unfortunate, but that's what's happening. And uh, the other thing you'll see with climate change is, uh, if you see this band of Tega that occurs on the northernmost Appalachian, if you remember, I said there's Paramo in Costa Rica and Panama that occurs here. Uh, these biomes will completely disappear with just a few uh, increases in temperature. So this has, climate change has great import, importance for uh, vegetation changes, especially on elevation gradients, okay? That's where we'll see it most rapidly. And that ends this lecture. So um, we'll wrap it up and we'll have one more lecture on diversity that covers our biomes. All right, thanks.